The reading is Joel chapter 3, and it's the whole chapter. In those days, and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, the, my people Israel. For they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine that they might drink. Now what have you against me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all you regions of Philistia? Are you repaying me for something I have done? If you are paying me back, I will swiftly and speedily return on your own heads what you have done. For you took my silver and my gold and carried off my finest treasures to your temples. You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks that you might send them far from their homeland. See, I am going to rouse them out of the places to which you sold them, and I will return on your own heads what you have done. I will sell your sons and daughters to the people of Judah, and they will send them to the Sabaeans, a nation far away. The Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weaklings say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations from every side and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the winepress is full and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the sky will tremble. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem through all generations. Their blood guilt, which I have not pardoned, I will pardon. The Lord dwells in Zion. How are we all? It's a bit like the uh, 8 a.m. service. Just a nice, mellow... Mm. <laughs> not, not a fired up, warm... But, but nice, steady warm. That's good. And I said, I said I would try then to be that nice, steady warm. But you know, I, I do have trouble being that. <laughs> but I enjoy it. I enjoy it. It's a good, it's a good, solid feeling. I've got to say it. I'm concerned that we don't have many young families here again. This has been videoed, this has been heard. But something is wrong. When there was something going wrong in Israel, something going wrong in Judah, 
God asked for a sacred assembly to be called. And he said, ask for a national day of fasting and prayer, of weeping and mourning. Yes, I think we are walking with God as people. I think we are a church that holds to the truth. Yes, I think that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again. But I also think there's a spiritual life that needs to be revived within our souls. I don't know who's called to be leader of the church. Whether it be Matt or I or someone else. Except that I know this as you do too. That the Lord Jesus Christ is our leader. Amen. He always will be our leader. And we need to look like he's our leader. We need to sound like he's our leader. Everything we do needs to look like he's our leader. Every decision we make needs to look like he's our leader. And I will keep saying it while the Lord lays it on my heart. Some days I try to get it right as a leader. And I, I, and I fail miserably. Some days I don't try and I fail miserably. <laughs> But some days I can try to do it myself. Other days I can try to do get let God do it. It doesn't matter what happens in my life as long as I'm doing what God asks me to do. Then I'm in that place of peace. It doesn't matter what we do as a church as long as we do what God asks us to do. Then we'll be in peace when we do what he asks us to do. I have grown weary of hearing about decisions that are made by processes rather than decisions that are made by prayer. I have grown weary of attitudes that are uh, talking about the, the word without living it, without breathing it. I grow weary when we talk about encouraging each other in sickness, but not in spiritual sickness. In the midst of suffering, but not in the midst of let's deal with what we've got going wrong. And I think that's part of the problem is that we're worried about that, that attitude of judgmentalism. We're worried about pointing fingers. We're worried about this or that. And the problem is that, that, that we too can be judgmental. We're all judgmental. God's saying... Wherever you're at today, I want your heart. I want your heart. And wherever at today, I want you to, to love your other person's heart. You know, we spend a lot of time and we get the most people at members meeting when major decisions need to be made. I would love members meetings to be full every time because we want to be there to be the community of God, to be the living and acting, active community of God to say, what can we do to help the church grow? What can we do to help the church be the people of God? What can we do to ch help the church live the people of God? Look like we're excited to be the people of God. Look like we're transformed forever and we're continually being transformed and we're moving toward the perfection that he intended for us, that he always had for us, that we have in the Lord Jesus, that we will see one day on, in heaven. Do we look forward to that day? That is the day of expectancy. That 
is how we should be living. That we try to live in a functional, like this is an organisation or a club. And I'm putting myself in this, by the way. I've been dealing, God's been dealing with me very harshly over the last few weeks. And he said, let me run this church. It wasn't what that I was necessarily wanting to, but I'm going, no, but we need to do this, do this, do this. No. Just come to me in prayer. Give yourself, Byron, and shut up. And then I come today, and, and I've got a message prepared. In the 8 a.m., another message which was just like little bits and pieces. And then he comes to me, he did that, and then I was just like, after that, I was just like, okay, God, I've just, and I had to spend more time out there going, God, whatever the message is, give it to me. And, and he's going, Byron, you're still getting in the way. And you know what? I think we're all still getting in the way of what God wants to do. And you say, well, how do we get out of it? Do you remember when God sent the locusts? What did he ask? He asked that they would rend their hearts, not their garments. He asked that they would lament, that they would weep, that they would mourn. He wanted them to remember that time. Remember and tell pass that on. You learn discipline, you remember. I had some good lessons as a kid. Those good lessons I remembered. Whether it be a uh, time out or a... It was something to direct me to the right way. When God directs us, he says, there's a problem. I want to grab your attention. I want to put you back on track. But please pass it on so others learn as well. When the locusts came and it was devastating and everything, including the fellowship with God, had been dried up, the people turned to God and he was merciful. Their land had dried up. The grain and, and the, the, the grapes and all of that, everything, all of their produce, eaten away by locusts. God restores. They remembered that. He restored, they restored, he restored fellowship. The grain, the wine, the oil flowed again. Flowed in abundance. They remembered that. Restored their shame. No longer in shame. They remembered that. So as we look to the next stage in chapter 3, we'll see some similar things. God deals with the opposition. He says he's going to round up all the nations. Anyone who's done anything against his people. In fact, what he's doing is he's saying, there's going to be no more shame. I'm not only going to restore honour to my people, I'm restoring honour to my name. I'm restoring honour to me. I am the Lord, your God, there is no other. Worship me. Submit to me. Give your whole heart to me. Give your whole self to me. Your whole will to me. Remember when you don't, it goes bad. Remember when you do, there is an overflow. And an overflow. And an overflow. Let our problem not be with with whether it be kids club or whether it be um, leadership decisions or, or maybe an AGM or something like that. 
Let our problems not be that. Let our problems be, how do we get to disciple these 500 people that keep coming in? How do we baptise when we don't have enough, we don't have enough room to baptise everyone? When we don't have enough time to baptise everyone? When we're too busy that we don't, can't fit the seven services in on a Sunday? And we go, Byron, you can't do seven services. I don't want to see seven services. I want to see eight services. I want to see eight services seven days a week. I want to see a house of prayer that goes non-stop 24-7, 365 days in the year. Amen? I don't want to see limit. I want to see an overflow. I want to see an overflow of expectancy. I want to see an overflow of the heart. I want to see an overflow of the attitude. I want to see an overflow that everyone who comes in starts to get a glimpse of how wonderful, how beautiful, how magnificent is our God. Do you want to get a bit of that? I want to get a bit of that. I want to pass on a lot of it. I just want to be overflowing, overflowing, overflowing. And I want our attitudes to change. That's Byron speaking to Byron. God through to us in his word. That's the mercy. The mercy is abundant. He has mercy for us all. He restored the land. In chapter 2, it was abundant showers. In 3.18, a fountain will flow out. It just keeps going and going and going. God keeps giving and giving and giving. And he says, yes, in those days, in that day, the day of the Lord, my day, that day, I won't go into day of the Lord today. That's not what this sermon is about lining all the things up and all the prophecies and let's know that the Lord will bring judgment but the Lord will bring mercy God is a God of justice but he's also a God of mercy these are the things that he wants us to really pay attention to he wants us to see him as a very generous God he wants us to see him as a, it wants us to see him as a very merciful, loving, compassionate father. But he doesn't want us to deny that he is a God of justice that says, I will not allow any sin and its effects in my house. Thank you very much. And if you want to come and be part of my house, you need to leave that at the door. Thank you, Jesus. That's the only way we get in. So in chapter 3, he deals with the opposition. He rounds up the opposition and he says he takes them to the valley of judgment. The va when I say the valley of judgment, it's the valley of Jehoshaphat which means God judges, God is judge. The valley of decision where God will judge. Now, when you're looking at the uh, things that they did, it's a bit like the injustices that we face today. Have you ever, like sometimes you ever sit on the news, and I do it less these days, but the news or current affairs, and you go, oh, just let me get it, my hands on them. You know, that needs to be dealt with. Why isn't the government dealing with that? Why aren't they doing that? Why aren't the police doing that? Why aren't the court system doing that? Has anyone ever wondered that before? And you're thinking, God, why aren't you dealing with this? All oh, those frustrating people. Why? Why aren't they? And, and you crazy protesters. And there's a number of things that we think. I, don't, I get less frustrated these days, thank God. But there's still an injustice. Things that are done, and we go, why, why on earth is that not being addressed? One of the things that you might think of is child trafficking. One of the ultimate. 
Dah bikin kali kalau buah ya, cik cik Here he's saying, I will do something. You want to be a child trafficker and you want to take down my people, I will come back at you. I will repay you for what you've done. That's what he says in chapter 3. I will repay you for what you've done. You think you can take God on? He says, I will repay you for what you do. You think you can hurt one of my people? I will repay you for what you do. You think you can make a mockery out of me by affecting my people? You will pay. And we think, oh my gosh, God is a, is a, is a heavy God. It's the injustice that we want to see. We want to see paid, but we don't want to see people hurt. The problem is we have, we have sin. We have rebelliousness. We have disobedience. We have the anti-God. And we cannot let that in. Remember we're looking forward to that perfect relationship with God. We cannot let that in. Anyone who holds on to that cannot enter in. Only those who say, Jesus, you are Lord. You take my sin. You died on the cross and rose again. You took my sin. And I have it no more. But he says to his people like he says to us, you think I haven't seen what the enemy has taken of yours? The years he has taken? I will restore your years. I will restore and more. I will give in an abundance. I will have it so that it would be, that you would be healed in a way that it would be like you were never hurt. It'll be like you were never harmed. You never suffered. You never had anything of that go on. That's what it'll be like. It'll be perfect. And the Lord's presence. In, in chapter, in verse 16, it says, The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The, heaven, the earth and the heavens will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Do you recall verses... And I'm sure most of you will recall verses in the Psalms, particularly of refuge, fortress, stronghold. Think of that safe place. This world is very wobbly right now. There is a lot of instability. We're not even sure where financially we could end up just like that. What if it dried up that we couldn't even buy food? What if it dried up that there was what, what, what if there was so much pain that there was war? That there was total social breakdown and anarchy? Oh, Byron, you're making things sound terrible. Whatever happens, God says, remember, I am your rock. I am your refuge. I am your fortress. I am your stronghold. In me, you are safe. In me, you are protected. And whatever happens, you will come to that place. 
you will be restored. I will restore you in all my mercy. I will give you an abundance like you've never seen before. I have, will heal you in a way that your memories will be healed. I will heal you in a way that you will be only looking to everything good. I will heal you in a way that peace will be fully in your heart. You will not worry. You will only know love. That is the stronghold. See, God has a stronghold for his people that we can run into, that we can run under into his shelter and shelter under him. And in him, nothing will touch us. Nothing, no sin and its effects will come in. We'll have eternal protection, eternal safety. It goes on and on and on. Have you ever wondered what it'd be like to just picture the best feeling you've ever had in your life where you felt so safe and secure, but you felt so joyous and so just life can't get any better. And then you go, okay. And then, then times it by I don't know how much and then have that go on for eternity. Nice place, isn't it? That's the stronghold of God. That's the presence of the Lord Jesus. That's the divine presence of God who has chosen to make his dwelling in us. Our enemies will be all shut out. Our spiritual enemies as well. So there, there if you look at the context of Joel, where they're looking at, at nations, we look at our spiritual enemy, our battle is not against flesh and blood. We look at the spiritual enemy and there is no way that that enemy is coming in the stronghold of God. You stay out and we have perfect life. You know, we think we have a great relationship with Jesus. We're going to have a perfect relationship with Jesus. Oh, see, that's... That's the thing that I can't get my head around, you know, the presence of God. I think, well, I thought, well, you know, it's like you've already got that perfect presence. That's, that's just me not getting a hold of it. But one day it'll be a perfect relationship where I talk to Jesus as he's always wanted me to talk to Jesus. And you get to talk to him. And you talk to Father and Holy Spirit. And we just have such a great time. You know, some of the best parties are by Zoom. <laughs> I saw a few people laughing. That was a joke. <laughs> Terrible joke. Not the right timing. <laughs> parties are had better when you come together. In that presence, that will be the ultimate. There won't be social distancing. There won't be awkward hugging with the creepy person. <laughs> you know the social awkwardness that you just go into a party and you just go, oh my gosh. When they talk about parties, you know, this time of celebration, I've got to tell you, the introvert part of my character, and you can ask Sash how I was with parties, particularly when we were first married. And uh, party? Oh no. Cringe people in a close proximity, it's actually not my thing. You may not pick it, but it's actually, it's actually not. I can actually function now in a lot because of, you know, like the farewell, and I can actually party and actually enjoy it. But naturally by nature, I'm not, I'm not that way inclined. But I know that when I get to heaven, I'll be so much a party animal. <laughs> And I won't have any more of that social awkwardness. And I won't have any more of that icky feel about people. I don't know what your inhibitions are, but leave them at the door once you get to heaven, because we're going to celebrate, amen? amen. Woohoo! 
We've got security in God. We've got his presence. We've got his peace. Everything is great. So why do we look so miserable? And why don't we want to catch up together? Let's be transformed. God wants us to be transformed. He wants us to be excited. He wants us to celebrate. He wants to look like us to look like the church is the best time of the week. Because others who have the Holy Spirit come and we get to share the Holy Spirit and what he's been doing. Who wants to share what God has been doing? We're going to be having some testimonies. If you want to give a testimony, come and see Matt or I and we, and we want to get you locked in in some point. Because we don't want to just be the ones sharing out the front. I tell you what, I had the best time this week when I was absolutely sick as a dog. So yeah, we did. Yeah, someone prayed that we have some time together and we got two days uh, lying on the couch just going, eh. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> no, it was the best times are with God. And sometimes you just need to go, I'm human. I'm sick, but you're a wonderful God. And soak that up. And, you know, I almost didn't feel sick at times because it was just, it was just a great time. God wants us to, to, to walk with each other through all the times, through times of grief, times of sickness, times of struggling. He wants us to walk through times of celebration and times of rejoicing in what he's done. When he was speaking to Joel, he said, I want my people to give me them whole self, their whole selves. In chapter 2 and chapter 3, one thing that he was saying what he was really saying over and over again, then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. In chapter 3, then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. I am God. I am the one and only. Know it, know it full well. The true glory that I have come in what I do is my glory. But not only is it my glory, it's for my people. I want to dwell in you. I want to dwell amongst you. And I want you in me. Run into that stronghold. This life, if you start looking at the news too much, you'll go crazy. It's too overwhelming. Run into the stronghold and feel the arms of God, the everlasting arms under you, around you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word I put my hope. He promises he's going to come and take us home. He promises he's going to restore his land. He's going to restore his people. He's going to restore relationship. He's going to bring justice, but he's going to bring mercy. And in the cross, we see mercy triumphs over, justice, over judgment. God wants us to wait with expectant hearts and to overflow with that expectancy. You say, Byron, how do we overflow with the expectancy? 
you have a look at a five-year-old looking at presents under a Christmas tree. And I'll tell you, that's how you overflow with expectancy. His word. Again, I'll say, open his word. Open our hearts. Let's pray. Lord God, you are speaking to us today and right now I've been impacted by this message more than I have all week or the last week. <coughs> Lord, there's many of us who are going to be challenged. Many of us is, who need to do something. We need to do something. We need to rend our hearts before you. We need to come to you and give our whole heart, our to love you with our heart, soul, mind and strength. To give ourselves 100% to you. To fully submit to your will. To fully submit to your purpose. And to say, it's not my purpose, Lord, it's yours. To look forward to the fullness of your presence. To look full forward to the fullness overflowing in us, Lord. And you have already given us your spirit. You've poured out your spirit. We have your presence, Lord, that you would fill us to overflowing more and more and more, that it would spill out everywhere, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to wait faithfully, expectantly, every day. By your spirit. By your word.